you know, I always feel like the children's story, this is not a complaint, this is a compliment, but I always feel like the children's story sort of one-ups me. The, the message is so simple and to the point that it's far more effective than what we do up here, but uh, especially true today. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you again to all the children's ministry leaders and for the wonderful work that they do. Uh, so yeah, thank, thank you guys uh, for all of your participation. I will just share, uh, if you expect it or not, one more brief thought <laughs> on uh, this morning's gospel reading, this story of Jesus on that evening of the day of the resurrection who shares the Holy Spirit with the disciples. So the Bible says, we just read it, that the disciples are locked in a room, right? They've hidden themselves away and locked the door. And why did they lock the door? You, you read it. We all read it together. Why, why is the door locked? For fear, right? And why would they be afraid? Well, because their master was just put to death, right? They don't know what's going to happen to them next, especially since at this point in the story, they've gone to the tomb and seen that it was empty. But they've yet to see Jesus, so they don't know what's going to happen. They don't, maybe they'll be blamed for stealing Jesus' body. You see, the women had reported to them, the women have seen Jesus, and they told the male disciples, but they didn't believe. And so here they are, locked away for fear. And to me, this strikes me uh, as a very appropriate image for the church, the disciples huddled together in fear. Because how often do you think in this space, we are gathered together in a sense with the doors locked. We gather together here because we feel safe, we feel comfortable here, but we're afraid to go out, right? But just as with anything, and, and I think of so many sort of natural images come to mind, but like a body of water, right, that doesn't have an outlet, what happens to it? Without running water, without it moving, it becomes stagnant and moldy and dead, right? And that's exactly what happens to the church. A church closed in on itself becomes full of infighting because we're more concerned with the politics in here than the mission out there, right? This is what we see with these disciples closed in on themselves, afraid to go out. So if we are like these disciples, it's possible that we gather together every week and we have each other, but like these disciples, they have each other, but they don't have Jesus. So what happens in this situation, locked away in fear, when Christ appears to them? He has a very simple message, and that's what I want to spend just a minute discussing with you. The first thing he says is, peace be with you. And he showed them his hands and his side, and he says again, peace be with you. Why peace? But because they're afraid. And this is the promise of Scripture. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3, The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And what? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the promise of prayer. You see, this is, this is the peace that God gives you. The promise of peace is not a promise that we will be spared suffering or pain or loss or death. We will experience those things, but the promise is, is that through it all, God will give us his peace. One of the choir pieces this morning was uh, this passage from John chapter 14, where Jesus says, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives, so do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. So we may like to end the message here with the message of peace, but you see there's a kind of inversion that happens because Jesus says, peace be with you, as he shows, him, as, as he shows the disciples the wounds in his hand and in his side, and as he shows them these wounds, he says, as the Father has sent me, I send you. What do you suppose is going on there? 
Jesus is showing them, this is what happened to me on my mission. And just as the Father sent me, now I'm sending you. It's an indication to the disciples that they too must go out. And when they go out, they will suffer. They will suffer for the gospel because the good news, as we've said, is not a message of comfort and wealth. It is a message of poverty and suffering. But there is a promise of peace through it all. And then it says he breathed on them, saying, receive the Holy Spirit. And it's crucial that we see the relationship between receiving the Holy Spirit and being sent out. He says, as the Father sent me, I send you. And he breathed on them, saying, receive the Holy Spirit. We have to see this connection. Receiving the Holy Spirit and being sent out are two sides of the same coin. We are sent out just as the Father sent Christ because and only because Christ has given us his spirit. That's why he breathes on them. This may be a kind of a strange image for us, Jesus breathing on the disciples, but in both Greek and Hebrew, the word for spirit is the same as the word for breath. So when he breathes on them, what is he doing but giving them his, his own spirit? giving them the Holy Spirit. You see, going all the way back to the beginning when Jesus is conceived, Scripture tells us that Jesus was conceived or born by the Holy Spirit. What exactly does that mean? Let's think about that for just a moment. Jesus was conceived even by the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? What are we talking about when we say the Holy Spirit? For all eternity, God has existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father and the Son exist in this state of ceaseless and perfect love for each other. The Father and Son exist in perpetual love for each other, and the Holy Spirit is their very shared breath. The Holy Spirit is the love shared between the Father and the Son. So when the Bible says, for instance, in 1 John 4, 8, the great interpreters of Scripture through the ages have always identified this as the Holy Spirit. When we say that God is love itself, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the love of God personified. So imagine the Father and the Son existing in all eternity with this wind, this breath of the Holy Spirit being constantly given and exchanged. That word spirit invites us to see this as a kind of inhaling and exhaling. The Father and Son caught in this eternal exchange of love. Giving and receiving this gift of the Holy Spirit between each other. So then when this gift of God, this love of God, this spirit of God is poured out on the Virgin Mary. It conceives in her the very person of the Son of God and gives humanity to Jesus Christ. So you see then, when you, when you have that imagery of what the Holy Spirit is, the Holy Spirit is the bond of love between the Father and the Son. If you understand that, then you understand why it's the greatest of all miracles that we would receive the Holy Spirit. It's unimaginable. And that's, it's because when we receive the Holy Spirit, we are being invited in to that most intimate of all relationships between the Father and the Son. And that's why the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of our adoption the spirit of our adoption. Think about that. Because if the Holy Spirit is this gift between the Father and the Son, then if we receive the Holy Spirit, what does that make us but children of God? Members of that bond of love. Paul says in Romans 8, 14, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, 
it is the very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You see, when we call God Father, that's only because we've received the spirit of God. And we've been caught into that relationship. And so again, John writes, and this is a passage that all of you know, but I hope maybe now you'll see it in a new light. 1 John 4, 1, he writes, Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called, what? Children of God. You see the Trinitarian structure of that? Behold what manner of love, the Spirit, the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. You can see now why Jesus says, As the Father sent me, I send you. He gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit because it is by receiving the Holy Spirit that we ourselves become children of God. Therefore, the mission of Jesus becomes our mission. And this is the last thing I want to say, is that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of our adoption, but the Holy Spirit is also the spirit of our mission. You see, Christ, the word Christ, or Messiah in Hebrew, means what? Most of you know this, right? What does Messiah mean? Anybody? The anointed one, right? The one who is anointed. So even when it's translated into Greek, so Messiah means the anointed one. The Greeks didn't have that same custom of anointing. So the word Christ literally means like sort of the oiled one or even the greasy one, the way they would... Uh, you know, athletes would put oil on themselves to, in a wrestling match. So, that's, so the word Christ, it took a little while for people to figure out what they meant by that exactly because it's a cultural thing. But, uh, so the word Christ or Messiah means anointed one, right? Because in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew culture, a prophet, a priest, a king would be anointed with oil as a sign of their mission and their calling. But all of this was foreshadowing the Messiah, the anointed one, who would be anointed not with oil, but with the Holy Spirit, to be a prophet, a priest, and a king. So Jesus is anointed with the Holy Spirit, and so as he says in his first sermon, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to do what? To bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And this is what is now happening with the apostles. The word apostle means the one who is sent. They are sent out into the world not just as mere representatives, but as themselves now children of God, themselves now anointed ones in a sense, because Christ gives them his own spirit. And that's why we can come to that surprising claim in verse 23 where Jesus says, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. If you do not forgive the sins of any, they're not forgiven. What do we make of this other than that Christ has given to the church his own mission of reconciling the world to himself? Paul says the same thing in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, God reconciled to us, God reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You see that? That we are sent out on the mission of Jesus. We are sent out as Christ into the world. Because we have received the Holy Spirit, Christ's mission is our mission. We have to stop being disciples, hiding behind locked doors, and become apostles sent out into the world, delivering the good news of God's love and forgiveness. Christ's mission is our mission. Christ's work is our work. We call his Father our Father, because he has made his spirit to be our spirit. Amen?